Rich Dad Poor Dad is one of those books that changed my approach to money since high school and it bonded me to my best friend, Grac. Gracula, you know who you are. <laughs> but seriously, it also was a book that is dead wrong in many ways, which I'll explain as I read the book so you don't have to. It's okay, there is a summary to start and then we go deeper into it. Robbie Kiyosaki's book is one of the best selling ones of all time because it shifted readers' minds from how to make money work for you and not you work for money. To set the scene, Robert was 50 years of age when his book was published. He'd been an entrepreneur, investor, and educator before then. His core messages were, your house is not an asset, invest for cash flow, and that too many people follow the go to college, get a job, save money, get a mortgage, and at the end, they got nothing left. Robert Kiyosaki grew up, as he writes, with two dads, a poor dad, which was his biological dad, and a rich dad, the dad of his best friend from school, Mike. Both dads were different in how they thought about money, and this difference is what led Kiyosaki to gain the insights that he lays down in his book. My name is Vito, welcome to Learners of Winners, you know that's you. Remember to like, subscribe, share, and join the Substack email newsletter at the link down below for a behind the scenes bonus to each video and enter the $100 comment competition, which is at the end of this video. And to answer the question, you've got to go right to the end because it only makes sense once you watch this video and gain the insights. So just like last video's winner, congratulations, we have messaged you. I'll read through key points page by page, unfolding the story that Robert writes about and explaining what makes sense and what doesn't. Remember, right now you're reading with me. So be one of the few, the proud, that's 5% literally of the people that are gonna watch this, who will get through and learn. Because the desire to read books I know is very high and many feel guilty, I've been there myself. Because books, number one, they cost money. Number two, you don't have the time to do it. And number three, distractions are always there to suck you away on apps, on TV, wherever. So remember, the uniqueness of books is that they have the highest density of information per minute of any medium. So you're getting the full story and not brainwashed with the cherry picked portions that only others want you to see and hear. Okay, having said that, I'm gonna give you a summary, cherry picked portions, because I know you trust me, um, but maybe, well, you shouldn't just yet, but I urge you to watch the rest of this video when you get a chance. So I have trust in you. I believe you're one of the 5%. You're one of the few, the proud, that will continue through this video because you're interested to learn the full story, not just the cherry pick portions. So let's begin with the cherry picked. The introduction, Robert writes, one dad said, the love of money is the root of all evil. The other said, the lack of money is the root of all evil. The way I'll say it is scarcity is the mother of all misery. That's the way I look at this lesson in the introduction. Chapter one, lesson one, the rich don't work for money, they have money work for them. Now here, through opening a business or investments, money is made without you selling your time. And that's really what Robert is all about in that chapter. Chapter two, lesson two, the rich people acquire assets. The poor and middle class acquire liabilities that they think are assets. Buying a home is a liability, Robert says, because you cannot get any rental income because you're paying off the mortgage and you can't really sell it because you're living in it. And if you do sell it, there is a large amount of tax you have to pay, limiting the profit you're gonna get. Chapter three, lesson three, mind your own business. The poor middle class employee works for almost everyone else except themselves. They work for the owners of the company for the job they work in. They work for the government because they pay taxes and they work for the bank because they pay off loans and credit cards. Chapter four, and of course, lesson four, the rich use corporations to minimize their taxes. They use them and companies in other countries, that's what corporations are called, to be able to spend money earned on expenses before it is taxed, as only the profits of a company are taxed. Chapter five, lesson five, the rich invent money. They find opportunities that others miss. They raise money, they gather the right people, and if you can raise money to build a home or to build a business, then you're inventing money in Robert's words. Chapter six, lesson six, 
work to learn and don't work for money. The main management skills Robert highlights that's needed for success areas are number one, you gotta be able to manage cash flow, systems, people, and most importantly, specialized skills, such as sales and marketing. Robert says the ability to sell, to communicate to another human being is probably the most important skill that exists out there and probably the most underutilized and undereducated skill that people get access to. Chapter seven, overcoming obstacles. Robert highlights there's five attributes that you need to change in order to overcome obstacles. Number one, fear. Two, cynicism. Three, laziness. Four, bad habits. And five, arrogance. Chapter eight, getting started. Here's where Robert recommends his recommendations. Number one, find a reason that's greater than reality. It's called the power of spirit. Obviously, that sounds like, you know, have a higher North Star to reach for, something beyond just yourself and beyond just making money. Number two, make daily choices, the power of choice. If you can, you know, make sure that you're the one choosing things, then you're gonna feel a lot better because you're gonna be feeling like you're in control of your life. Number three, choose friends carefully. The power of association is very important. You know, the usual saying that you are the average of the five people you associate with most. Number four, master a formula and then learn a new one. The power of learning quickly. It's a big thing for Robert to make sure that you keep on learning. You don't stick with the same thing, but you always challenge your own beliefs to improve on them. Number five, pay yourself first. The power of self-discipline. Uh, he goes on the deep end here saying, hey, if you need to, don't pay off anybody else. Pay yourself first. I don't know about that, but we'll find out more. Chapter nine, you still want more? Here are some to-dos. That was actually his title. You still want more? Here are some to-dos. He says, stop doing what you're doing, meaning look around for new ideas, find someone who has done what you want to do and obviously learn from them. Take classes, read, attend seminars. He's done a lot of those things he says in his book. Jog, walk and drive in certain areas once a month for 10 minutes. Uh, that's to do with him finding new property deals, which is one way that he makes money that we'll find out about. Then he says, shop for bargains in all markets and look for people who want to buy first and think big, learn from history, action always beats inaction. And his last section was called final thoughts. And he lists four types of income in the world with passive income being the most important because obviously you might know passive means you don't need to work for it and it is basically working for you. Now you're going to read with me. So strap in, begin the timer. It's gonna be at the top. Let's go because I'm going to, in this introduction, go through the battle between which dad he should be listening to because that's Robert's key dilemma in the beginning. And I'm going to be looking at my laptop right here and on this side of the video, you're gonna have a pop-up of a quote of what it is that I'm reading. So you read with me, basically. Let's begin. Chapter one, lesson one, the rich don't work for money. The year was 1956, I was nine years old. By some twist of fate, I attended the same public school where the rich people sent their kids. We were primarily a sugar plantation town. The managers of the plantation and the other affluent people, such as doctors, business owners, and bankers sent their children to this elementary school. After grade six, the children were generally sent off to private schools. Now, Robert seems to be a little interested in the elite, you know, about how to become one of them. Nothing wrong with that, um, but you know, some have a negative view of elitism and want none of it. Whereas Robert was very much, hey, how do I become one of these folks? And I think it's important if you want to do that that you're doing it for yourself rather than for the approval of other people. Because to be honest, other people don't give a crap about you as much as you think probably like 10% or less, people even notice you when you think, oh, someone's looking at me. So keep that in mind. Robert asked his dad, how do I make money? Well, use your head, son, his dad said smiling. Even then, I knew that really meant, that's all I'm going to tell you, or I don't know the answer, so don't embarrass me. The next morning, I told my best friend, Mike, what my dad had said. As best as I could tell, Mike and I were the only poor kids in this school. Mike was also in the school by a twist of fate. By the way, Mike is a real person. Um, his real name is Alan, and he was on 
Robert Kiyosaki's own podcast a few years ago where Robert finally decided to expose the secret that Alan is a real person and revealed that to the world. And Alan was, you know, he sounded like a nice guy. And the reason back in 1997 when Rich Dad was published that we did not know Alan, Mike or Rich Dad who we'll find out about was a real person was because they wanted privacy and they signed a, a confidentiality agreement with Robert about that. So just a little bit of a trivia there. So what do we do to make money? Mike asked. I don't know, I said, but do you want to be my partner? For the next several weeks, Mike and I ran around neighborhood knocking on doors and asking our neighbors if they would save their toothpaste tubes for us. With puzzled looks, most adults consented with a smile. Some asked us what we were doing, to which we replied, we can't tell you, it's a business secret. <laughs> so keeping a business secret can be good okay but can also be bad so there's you know two different ideas if you should or you shouldn't tell somebody about what it is you're doing um but the longer that you delay on average telling anybody about it um the worse it likely will be because you do not know absolutely everything and you don't have all the ideas so when you do at least tell a few people which you can do under nda non-disclosure agreement is what a lot of businesses use, then you can get new ideas that challenge your own, you know, hyped up view of what this is going to be about. And Robert and Mike learn about this and it, it helps them not waste time. So let's find out about their business secret. One day, my dad drove up with a friend to see two nine-year-old boys in the driveway with a production line operating at full speed. There was fine white powder everywhere. On a long table were small milk cartons from school and our family's hibachi grill was glowing with red hot coals at maximum heat. Dad walked up cautiously, having to park the car at the base of the driveway since the production line blocked the carport. As he and his friend got closer, they saw a steel pot sitting on top of the coals in which the toothpaste tubes were being melted down. In those days, toothpaste did not come in plastic tubes. The tubes were made of lead. So once the paint was burned off, the tubes were dropped in the small steel pot. They melted until they became liquid. And with my mum's pot holders, we poured the lead through a small hole in the top of the milk cartons. Oh no, my dad exclaimed. You're casting nickels out of lead. That's right, Mike said. We're doing as you told us. We're making money. <laughs> Man, I wish I had this idea uh, myself, literally making money. Sad thing is um, not much lead around. Uh, and even then you get lead poisoning. So that's not a good thing. <laughs> Research lead poisoning, it's really horrible and it still exists, sadly. Um, it is illegal, my dad said gently but you boys have shown great creativity and original thought. Keep going, I'm really proud of you. If you boys want to learn how to be rich, don't ask me. Talk to your dad, Mike. My dad? Asked Mike with a scrunched up face. Yes, your dad, repeated my dad with a smile. Your dad and I have the same banker and he raves about your father. He's told me several times that your father is brilliant when it comes to making money. Now we get introduced to the main character and the title of the book himself, Rich Dad, because he is a real person, like I mentioned. His name was Richard Wassman Kimmy. Uh, and that's him in the photo there, uh, apparently, uh, according to the internet. Let's find out more about what he says. This is Rich Dad. Mike says you want to learn to make money. Is that correct, Robert? I nodded my head quickly, but with little trepidation. He had a lot of power behind his words and smile. Okay, here's my offer. I'll teach you, but I won't, won't do it in classroom style. You work for me, I'll teach you. You don't work for me, I won't teach you. I can teach you faster if you work, and I'm wasting my time if you just want to sit and listen like you do in school. That's my offer, take it or leave it. The result? of that was Robert's entry to paid work. Much earlier than all of his other colleagues and classmates, at nine years old, he actually started, according to this, work and work for money and do work that pretty much isn't 
the most shiniest type of work you can do, manual work. So let's find out more. What it was. We spent three hours taking canned foods off the shelves, brushing each can with a feather duster to get the dust off, and then restacking them neatly. It was excruciatingly boring work. There were, so this was, by the way, what he's gonna say, these were the early version of the 7-Eleven convenience stores. They were little neighborhood grocery stores where people bought items such as milk, bread, butter, and cigarettes. By Wednesday of the fourth week, I was ready to quit. I had agreed to work only because I wanted to learn to make money from Mike's dad. And now I was a slave for 10 cents an hour. On top of that, I had not seen Mike's dad since that first Saturday. I'm quitting. I told Mike at lunchtime, school was boring and now I didn't even have my Saturdays to look forward to. Dad said this would happen. And he said to meet him when you were ready to quit. So Robert confronts Rich Dad, much like a worker, confronts their boss and tells them, hey, I'm being exploited, give me a higher raise or I'm getting the hell out of here. You said that you would teach me if I worked for you. Well, I've worked for you, I've worked hard, I've given up my baseball games to work for you, but you haven't kept your word and you haven't taught me anything. Rich Dad says in reply, if you learn life's lessons, you will do well. If not, life will just continue to push you around. People do two things. Some just let life push them around, others get angry and they push back. But they push back against their boss or their job or their husband or wife. They do not know it's life pushing them. Most people want everyone else in the world to change but themselves. Let me tell you, it's easier to change yourself than everyone else. Most people want everyone else in the world to change but themselves. I just said that. Finally, I, Robert speaking here, looked up and asked, so what will solve the problem? Rich Dad said this, leaning forward in his chair and tapping gently on the head, the stuff between your ears. It was at that moment that Rich Dad shared the pivotal point of view that separated him from his employees and my poor dad and led him to eventually become one of the richest men in Hawaii while my highly educated but poor dad struggled financially for his whole life. Lesson number one, the poor and middle class work for money. The rich have money work for them. This is the biggest lesson probably in all of rich dad, poor dad. Um, and it's also because uh, it's also one of the worst, I don't want to say lessons, the wrong. As I mentioned at the start, this is one of the things that are wrong about this book. He doesn't tell you, Robert doesn't tell you how to exactly do this. Like it's great to say, hey, this is like how the rich do it, but he doesn't tell you how they do it. And it makes this whole kind of, you know, religion about this, hey, make money work for you. Only problem is, how do you do that? So my rich, like, and this is my rich dad continued my first lesson. I'm glad you got angry about working for 10 cents an hour. If you hadn't gone angry and had simply accepted it, I would have to tell you that I could not teach you. You see, true learning takes energy, passion, and a burning desire. Anger is a big part of that formula for passion is anger and love combined. When it comes to money, most people want to play it safe and feel secure. So passion does not direct them, fear does. And it really sounds like, you know, Yoda in Star Wars here, what, what, what Rich Dad is saying, um, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Um, so, okay, all, all, all the jokes aside, Rich Dad is not a Sith Lord. Um, in human reality, we should monitor our emotions uh, because they can be a good indicator uh, of something that we should logically go about changing, like our habits, because the emotion comes first, sometimes, not always, and then it's an indication that we've got to change something in ourselves or in our day, daily routines. So let's go again. So is that why they'll take jobs with low pay, I asked. Yes, said Rich Dad. Some people say I exploit people because I don't pay as much as the sugar plantation of a government. 
I say the people exploit themselves. It's their fear, not mine. But don't you feel you should pay them more? Robert asks. I don't have to. And besides, more money will not solve their problems. Just look at your dad. He makes a lot of money and he still can't pay his bills. Most people, given more money, only get into more debt. Now, I can see anyone on the left hearing what Rich Dad just said and getting completely pissed off because it sounds like what a capitalist rich dad pig he is. Um, I don't have to pay them anymore is really what he's saying. But there's a moral to this in a way. Um, I'm not saying it's great, but he kind of is hoping that, you know, his workers will learn to do what he is teaching little Robert learn. But of course, is he really teaching his workers to do that? No, um, I'm sure he's not teaching them like he's teaching Robert. You see, your dad went to school and got an excellent education so he could get a high paying job but he still has the money problems because he never learned anything about money in school. On top of that, he believes in working for money. But if you want to learn how to have money work for you, then I will teach you that, but only if you want to learn. Wouldn't everyone want to learn, I asked? Well, no, said Rich Dad, simply because it's easier to learn to work for money, especially if fear is your primary, primary emotion when the subject of money is discussed. Okay, so clarity here for the Jedi reference before, according to Rich Dad, apparently now, uh, the fearful, the fearful workers um, are like the Sith uh, and the capitalists like him are the Jedi. Um, if that's, he's looking, he's painting himself as to be, to be the hero and the workers to be the enemy. Um, I'm being a little bit slack here, but you know what I'm saying if you know Star Wars, hopefully you do. One day they wake up He's talking about workers now. One day they wake up with big money problems and then they can't stop working. That's the price of only knowing how to work for money instead of studying how to have money work for you. So do you still have the passion to learn? Asked Rich Dad. I nodded my head. Good, said Rich Dad. Now get back to work. This time I will pay you nothing. What? I asked in amazement. You heard me, nothing. You will work the same three hours every Saturday, but this time you will not be paid 10 cents per hour. You said you wanted to learn to not work for money, so I'm going to pay you nothing. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Doesn't sound like Rich Dad is the Sith Lord now, between me and you, right? Um, <laughs> sounds like he's completely evil. And so does Robert think that. That's not fair, I shouted. You've got to pay something. Rich Dad tapped me on the head. Use this, he said. If you use it well, you will soon thank me for giving you an opportunity and you will grow into a rich man. Now, isn't it funny that both, if you remember, uh, Robert's poor dad tapped him on the head at the beginning, you know, when they melted the lead and stuff like that. Um, and now all of a sudden, rich dad does the same tapping on the head. People's lives are forever controlled by two emotions, fear and greed offer them more money and they continue the cycle by increasing their spending. This is what I call the rat race. And the rat race is a big idea. The rat can never get off the hamster wheel, right? And because it's always running, um, it just never thinks, okay, how do I get off? Because it's just a never ending loop. And that's back in the 1950s, those experiments that they did with hamsters. Um, and really, um, Robert also makes a big deal out of uh, the rat race because he has a game that has been around since this Rich Dad Poor Dad book since 1997 called the Cash Flow Quadrant Game and the main enemy there is the rat and your aim is to get out of the rat race and that's how you win the game. Mike and I heard what he said but didn't understand fully what he was talking about. I just knew that I often wondered why grown-ups off hurried off to work. It did not seem like much fun and they never looked that happy, but something kept them going. People also work for money because of desire. They desire money for the joy they think it can buy, but the joy that money brings is often short lived and they soon need more money for more joy, more pleasure, more comfort and more security. So they keep on working. Oh, I'm not interested in money yet they'll work for a job for eight hours a day. That's a denial of truth. If they were interested in money, then why are they working? So what he's getting at here is that people are fearful uh, and a lot of people say they don't work for money, 
um, or they don't need money, um, but you know they're really fearful of losing their job and potentially they're fearful of striking it out on their own uh, because there is a lot to lose once you stop working pretty much. You know, you don't know really what to do. And that's another problem which this book doesn't cover. Robert talks about it, you know, having a business, but he just doesn't talk about how to do it. So he says it like it's great to do this, but he doesn't tell you how to do it, which is another thing that's wrong. Be an observer, not a reactor to your emotions. For example, said Rich Dad, if the fear of not having enough money arises, instead of immediately running out to get a job, they instead might ask themselves this question, will a job be the best solution to this fear over the long run? In my opinion, the answer is no. Wrong, I have to say. In reality, um, people need to save up uh, to just be able to leave their job. Sure, a nine-year-old Robert, like in this book, uh, can risk losing his job uh, with Rich Dad by quitting, but an adult with bills to pay, that's not gonna happen. So that's another thing that, you know, he slides these little things in like, oh, you know, you can leave your job or Rich Dad says this or that. I mean, no, Rich Dad's got a lot of money. That's why he's called Rich Dad, right? Other people can't do that. So there's another thing that's wrong with some of these messages, messaging that is in the book. I hear things like, well, everyone has to work or the rich are crooks or I'll get another job. I deserve this raise. You can't push me around or I like this job because it's secure. No one asks, is there something I'm missing here which would break through the emotional thought and give you time to think clearly? So after Rich Dad's challenge, um, where he tapped you know, Robert on the head and said, use it well, Robert and Mike, they came up with an idea um, and it was pretty good, I gotta say. So here's the idea, to have money work for them and not them work for money. Miss Martin, who was an employee of Rich Dad, was cutting the front page of the comic book in half. She kept the top half of the comic book cover and threw the rest of the book into a large cardboard box. When I asked her what she did with the comic books, she said, I throw them away, I give the top half of the cover back to the comic book distributor for credit when he brings in the new comics. He's coming in one hour. Mike and I waited for an hour. Soon the distributor arrived and I asked him if we could have the comic books. To my delight, he said, you can have them if you work for the store and do not resell them. If you don't ask, you don't get. That's the lesson here. Because as we'll see, remember our old business partnership? Well, Mike and I revived it. Using a spare room in Mike's basement, we began piling hundreds of comic books in that room. Soon our comic book library was open to the public. We hired Mike's younger sister, who loved to study, to be head librarian. She charged each child 10 cents admission to the library, which was open from 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. every day after school. Mike and I averaged $9.50 per week over a three month period. By not getting paid for our work, at the store we were, and he's talking about when they used to work at the grocery store for no money. By not getting paid for our work at the store, we were forced to use our imaginations to identify an opportunity to make money. By starting out our own business, the comic book library, we were in control of our own finances, not dependent on an employer. The best part was that our business generated money for us even when we weren't physically there. Our money worked for us. Now, this is where I insert the rant the rant, okay, rant time. So just a quick rant from me about what we just heard, which was the finale of the first chapter, the magical realization that Robert and Mike had of what Rich Dad was trying to pummel into them, which was make money work for you, not you work for money. What did they do? They started a business. They became entrepreneurs. And sadly, this is the wrong thing that I say about Rich Dad Poor Dad that we're gonna find, he doesn't even talk about the word entrepreneurship. He doesn't even mention it in the entire book, almost. He doesn't even define it. Now, entrepreneurship is what Mike and Robert did with their comic book store just then, right? They were able to make money work for them because they hired people, they put stuff in front of customers, their you know, classmates that wanted to read those comic books. Nothing though is talked about how he did that, why he did that, why that worked, and it's a real shame 
because on top of it, Rich Dad, the basis of this entire book, he became rich because of entrepreneurship. You're hearing it from Robert's mouth himself. And he had grocery stores, Rich Dad did. He had all these other businesses. Yet Robert is going to keep on banging on that Rich Dad made his money work for him through investments. That's true, but where are you gonna begin if you're someone who's the average person starting out from nothing, unless you grow up in, I don't know, like a silver spoon fed family that gives you everything, but that's not 99.9% .9 of people. We always have to start at the foundation level and build up from that. So how are you teaching anybody to do that when you're saying, hey, go and start investing? No one has money to start investing, Robert, right? We've got to begin at somewhere. So you've got to tell people, how did you begin the business or how did Rich Dad begin his businesses and begin the entrepreneurship journey? Because that's really what gave him money to then go and invest that money to make money through property and all the other investments that we'll read about. I'll stop my rant. Let's get on to the second chapter. Chapter two, lesson two, why teach financial literacy? In 1990, Mike took over his father's empire and is in fact doing a better job than his dad did. In 1994, I retired at the age of 47 and my wife, Kim, was 37. I am concerned that too many people are too focused on money and not on their greatest wealth, their education. Um, sorry to break it to you, Robert, but when you don't have money, it's kind of all you think about, right, before you know, you go through education. But Robert counters this with, if you think money will solve problems, they will have a rough ride. Intelligence solves problems and produces money. We've all heard stories of lottery winners who are poor then suddenly rich and then poor again. And he puts a great saying here, I've got to be honest, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. And that's correct. And now he goes into the rules. Rule one, you must know the difference between an asset and a liability and buy assets. Rich people acquire assets. The poor middle class acquire liabilities that they think are assets, said Rich Dad. What defines an asset? Are not words, but numbers. And if you can't read the numbers, you can't tell an asset from a hole in the ground. In accounting, Rich Dad would say, it's not the numbers, but what the numbers are telling you. It's just like words. It's not the words, but the story the words are telling you. So here Robert puts um, a diagram uh, to explain all of this. This one, this first one, is the cash flow pattern of an asset, as you will see here. The top part of the diagram is an income statement, often called a profit loss statement. It measures income and expenses, money in and money out. If you want to be rich, spend your life buying assets. If you want to be poor or middle class, spend your life buying liabilities. In financial reporting, reading numbers is looking for the plot the story of where the cash is flowing. So here is also a cash flow image of a liability, an example being a car. And as you can see, it does not give income. It only leads to expenses, which is why it sits in the liabilities column. This next diagram is the poor person diagram. Their only income comes from a job. And then from that income goes to expenses in and out. The middle class diagram next. The only income is a job again, and it's spent on liabilities and expenses. And this last diagram is the rich person diagram. Yep, that's right, rich dad. The assets here provide them an income, not a job. So they don't, again, have to work for money, but money works for them via the assets that they own. Now, Robert goes into a rant. That is the reason. It is so hard to motivate kids in school today. They know that professional success is no longer solely linked to academic success as it once was. When you're young, you question grown-ups, which is great. Um, and kids can be right because school doesn't teach the skills to take a different path to make money. Um, but then again, uh, you know, kids learn a lot. Uh, and what you know in school is not what you think about later. Uh, in life, um, and that's a different story we'll go into. But Robert now gives a rant, and quite an accurate one. The classic story of hardworking people has a set pattern. Recently married, the happy, highly educated young couple moves into one of their cramped rented apartments. Immediately, they realize that they are saving money because two can live as cheaply as one. The problem is the apartment is cramped. They decide to save money to buy their dream home so they can have kids. They now have 
two incomes and they begin to focus on their careers. Their incomes begin to increase. As their incomes go up, their expenses go up. As well as a result of their incomes increasing, they decide to buy the house of their dreams. Once in their house, they have a new tax called property tax. Then they buy a new car, new furniture and new appliances to match their new house. All of a sudden, they wake up and their liabilities column is full of mortgage and credit card debt. Their liabilities go up. They're now trapped in the rat race. Pretty soon, a baby comes along and they work harder. The process repeats itself. Higher incomes cause higher taxes, also called bracket creep. A credit card comes in the mail. They use it and they max it out. This is the rat race. But as I like to call it, it's the system. You know the saying when they say, you know, this person's dropped out of the system? Because the system is really, like, really, I guess, what you'd call the reality of the situation, right? It's not exactly like this horrible negative thing. It's like the system that's been created um, inadvertently for different people over time, over history, acting together and sometimes against each other. Whenever, and sorry, now it goes, it is the same fear the fear of ostracism that causes people to conform to and not question commonly accepted opinions or popular trends. Your home, is a, your, home is a, your home is an asset. Get a bill consolidation loan and get out of debt. Work harder. It's a promotion. Someday I'll be vice president. Save money. When I get a raise, I'll buy a bigger house. Mutual funds are safe. Now Robert returns to his own biography. Whenever the teacher said, if you don't get good grades, you won't do well in the real world. Mike and I just raised our eyebrows. When we were told to follow set procedures and not deviate from the rules, we could see how school discouraged creativity. We started to understand why our rich dad told us that schools were designed to produce good employees instead of employers. He told us over and over again. And, and by the way, this is great that he's talking about the fact that school doesn't help. Um, but again, like, like I said earlier, Robert doesn't help explain entrepreneurship, which is really what gave him the big idea uh, earlier on and gave Rich Dad his wealth. Going to Rich Dad now, he told us over and over again, an intelligent person hires people who are more intelligent than he is. He told, one day my dad told me that our home was his greatest investment. A not too pleasant argument took place when I showed him why I thought a house was not a good investment. The diagram you see here shows how people view a home. To most, it's an asset, but in reality, it's a liability. For most, the mortgage is the largest expense that they have on a weekly, monthly basis, and that sucks most of their money. And they've got usually nothing left because of that large mortgage payment. It's the biggest expense. The following diagram on the left shows my poor dad's income statement. It shows that his income and expenses are equal to his liabilities. And the liabilities are larger than his assets. The following, a review of my rich dad's financial statement shows why the rich get richer. The asset column generates more than enough income to cover his expenses with the balance reinvested into the asset column. The asset column continues to grow and therefore the income it produces grows with it. The result is that the rich get richer. So Robert here is sort of like really pumped up. He sounds like he's cracked uh, the theory of evolution, but for finance. Why the middle class struggle? The middle class finds itself in a constant state of financial struggle. Their primary income is through their salary. As their wages increase, so do their taxes. Their expenses tend to increase in proportion to their salary increase. Hence the phrase, the rat race. They treat their home as their primary asset instead of investing in income producing assets. Based on the income outline, people work for money and that money is given to three major entities Robert talks about. You work for the company, Employees make the business owner or the shareholders rich, not themselves. Your efforts and success will provide for the owner's success and retirement. Number two, you work for the government because you've got to pay taxes. And for most people, working from January to May of every year is just simply working for the taxation portion of their income because they're not going to ever see that income. It's all going to go to the government. And that's a really sad thing when you think about it. 
Number three, you work for the bank, as we just talked about. The mortgage you pay, the expenses, the credit card debts, all the loans. That's the bank you're working for. But Robert, as you can guess, explains that he's different. I now have income generated from assets each month that fully cover my monthly expenses. If I want to increase my expenses, I first must increase my cash flow to maintain this level of wealth. Also note that it is at this point that I'm no longer dependent on my wages. He's a hero. I have focused on and been successful in building an asset column that has made me financially independent. If I quit my job today, I would be able to cover my monthly expenses with the cash flow from my assets. Chapter three, lesson three, mind your own business. A problem with school is that you often become what you study. So if you study cooking, you become a chef. If you study the law, you become an attorney and a study of auto mechanics makes you a mechanic. The mistake in becoming what you study is that too many people forget to mind their own business. They spend their lives minding someone else's business and making that person rich. Financial struggle is often the result of people working all their lives for someone else. Remember him saying earning a wage means working for a boss. A large wage means larger taxes, higher living expenses and paying off bank loans. That's true to an extent. There's always a thing with us, with humans, the more we earn, the more we spend. That's why it's what you save, not what you earn. So many people have put themselves in deep financial trouble when they run short of income to raise cash, they sell their assets, but their personal assets can generally be sold for only a fraction of the value that is listed on their personal balance sheet. Or if there is a gain on the sale of the assets, they are taxed on the gain. So that's called in most countries, capital gains tax, sales tax. Um, it's different for every country. Robert now shows that he's the main man because he says, in my world, Real assets fall into the following categories. Businesses that do not require my presence, they are managed by other people, I don't have to work there, and it's not a business because if it's a business, it becomes my job, he says. So here's another problem that we talked about. He's not defining entrepreneurship, he's now bagging out businesses, even though business is really what made him have a light bulb moment with the comic book business that him and Mike began to learn Rich Dad's lessons, and Rich Dad, as we know and explained, had all his wealth generated originally from businesses, and that's how he then was able to invest in assets, which made him money. So he bags up businesses, now he talks about stocks, bonds, income generating real estate, which he loves to death, and we'll talk about that later on. Notes, IOUs, they basically mean debt, so he lends out money to other people who pay him interest, Royalties from intellectual property like music scripts, patents, and of course now this book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, and many other books that he's written. He probably gets royalties. And anything else that has value, produces income, or appreciates, and has a ready market. Ready market meaning someone willing to buy it. I like starting companies, not running them. So my stock buys are usually of small companies. Fortunes are made in new stock issues, and I love the game. Many people are afraid of small cap companies, and I call and call them risky. And they are, but the risk is diminished if you love what the investment is, understand it and know the game. With small companies, my investment strategy is to be out of the stock in a year. Um, now again, uh, <laughs> he's saying that he's really like speculating if he's out in a year, uh, you know, he probably buys when the company lists and then sells when, you know, it's starting to kind of tumble down, which, you know, isn't the best way to invest. I mean, people who love value investing, like Warren Buffett style investing, are really gonna take an issue with that. But that's what Robert Kiyosaki does. He says here, I don't encourage anyone. And this is a really bad one. Um, like, uh, j j j just so you know, um, most people won't be able to buy a stock before it lists on the stock exchange. You even need to be part of the founding team or else you need to be a really wealthy investor. And 99.9% .9 of people are neither of those, okay? So Robert's really hyping himself and flexing right now by saying all of that. And also, most countries, if you sell an asset, and shares are an asset, just like property is an asset, if you sell before a year passes, you're hit with a higher capital gains tax. 
or sales tax, whatever it's called. So with him saying he sells within a year, with within 12 months, not over 12 months, it really means that, I don't know, he's paying more taxes. And by the way, this was 1997, the rules might have changed in the US, that's where he was writing, or in other countries, but in most countries, it's still 12 months, sell before, pay higher tax. So after 12 months, pay less tax. Now he really bags out entrepreneurship and I don't know what's going on when it really is the basis of his light bulb moments with Mike and his dad and his rich dad's wealth. I don't encourage anyone to start a company unless they really want to. Knowing what I know about running a company, I wouldn't wish that task on anyone. There are times when people can't find employment and starting a company seems like the best solution, but the odds are against success. Nine out of 10 companies fail in five years. Of those that survive the first five years, nine out of every 10 of those eventually fail as well. So only if you really have the desire to own your own company, do I recommend it. Otherwise, keep your day job and mind your own business. When I say mind your own business, I mean to build and keep your asset column strong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Are you confused like I am? I'm malfunctioning. Earlier, Robert said that Rich Dad taught him this, and I quote, if the fear of not having enough money arises, instead of immediately running out to get a job, they instead might ask themselves this question, will a job be the best solution to this fear over the long term? In my opinion, the answer is no. But now, Robert is saying, here, don't start a business. Uh, and remember my rant of what Robert has conveniently um, said? that Rich Dad's money originally came from the business he set up, that Robert's light bulb moment happened when they started the comic book business. So, I mean, Rich Dad is an entrepreneur first. He's an investor second. Robert also is an entrepreneur first and an investor second in many ways. But he doesn't talk about entrepreneurship. So again, Robert is going against what Rich Dad said, because as we'll find out, Robert failed in his first business, and he talks about it openly in this book, um, somewhat openly. But in our later books, he definitely goes into detail. On his podcast, he goes into detail. And on his many interviews, he's gone into more detail. So you got to take what he says with a grain of salt, because obviously that failure has left a lot of scars. And you can see it right here. Even though business is really the role model of what made his rich dad the richest man in Hawaii, Robert decides to go back on everything he earlier said and what really Rich Dad said. So otherwise, keep your day job and mind your business. Bad Robert, bad again. I'm not saying entrepreneurship is easy. No, it's not easy, but it's learnable. Um, and it is essential with automation happening like AI, and a lot of other technologies where software just speeds things up and does what us humans can't possibly do in one minute or one hour. Um, it's essential to actually teaching the next generation and that's what you know school is all about too. And I think that evolution is gonna happen soon, especially with classes to do with learning how to make businesses and to learn how to think importantly, creatively, because entrepreneurship is creativity combined with making something for others, therefore earning money and income. So now let's move on to chapter four. Lesson four, the history of taxes and the power of corporations. My rich dad did not see Robin Hood as a hero. He called him Robin Hood a crook. I often still hear people say, why don't the rich pay for it? Or the rich should pay more in taxes and give it to the poor. All capitalists and Ayn Randists would be proud. Uh, but now he really sinks the knife in. The reality is that the rich are not taxed. <laughs> it's the middle class, especially the educated upper income middle class who pays for the poor. What he means is that the rich minimize their taxes and he will say that they do it legally. Uh, I'm sure quite a few investigations since 1997 um, uh, will we'll show otherwise. There's a few murky and not so nice things that people with money do in terms of offshore corporations, uh, tax havens and things like that. So grain of salt there. When you study the history 
of taxes, an interesting perspective emerges. The rich saw an opportunity because they don't play by the same set of rules. The rich knew about corporations, income tax rates. A corporation is merely a legal document that creates a legal body without a soul. And a lot of people know what that means, right? <laughs> Just when you work in a boring job and the company is a bureaucracy. Um, a corporation is merely a legal document that creates a legal body without a soul. Using it, the wealth of the rich was once again protected. It was popular because the income tax rate of a corporation is less than the individual income tax rates. In addition, certain expenses could be paid by a corporation with pre-tax dollars. Like we talked about earlier, if you have expenses, you pay for them with the income that the corporation earns and that income is not taxed. The only thing that's taxed is the profit made and that's right after the expenses are deducted from the income. That profit that's left over is taxed. And that's a real big benefit for a lot of people, depending on what you're using it for expense purposes. Also, company tax rates can be higher than your personal tax rate. It depends on your wage bracket. Yes, certain expenses can be paid off by a corporation, but they need, importantly, to be related to the operation of the corporation and not your own personal expenses. Um, as a person. If you do that, then you're breaking the rules and uh, Robert seems to like that. I mean, not putting words in his mouth, but there's a little bit of, you know, gray area of what he's talking about from the looks of things. If you're ignorant, it's easy to be bullied. If you know what you're talking about, you have a fighting chance. This is why he paid so much, he's talking about Rich Dad here, it's why he's paid so much for smart tax accountants and attorneys. It was less expensive to pay them than to pay the government. His best lesson to me was be smart and you won't be pushed around as much. You also need uh, money to be able to do that, right? <laughs> to hire those people that will you know, save you money. He further mentions what I find is two big advantages to a corporation. Um, which is true, which is true. Number one, it's the tax advantages like we talked about um, just now. Um, a corporation earns, then it spends everything it can, and then it's taxed on anything that is left. Uh, it's, you know, he mentions here one of the biggest legal tax loopholes that, that the rich use, um, and, and, and it's legitimate um, according to the law, that is morality put aside. Then the second one is protection from lawsuits. When someone sues a wealthy individual, they are often met with layers of legal protection and often that um, the wealthy person actually, and then you find that the wealthy person actually control the assets, but they don't own them. So the, the corporation owns the asset, but the person, the rich person controls the corporation. So you see how that sort of works? Now Robert reveals what he got up to after school. This is his, the middle life story. It was not until my mid twenties that my rich dad's advice began to make more sense to me. I was just out of the Marine Corps and working for Xerox. I was making a lot of money, but every time I looked at my paycheck, I was disappointed. The deductions were so large and the more I worked, the greater they became. As I became more successful, my bosses talked about promotions and raises. I was flattered, but I could hear my rich dad asking in my ear, who are you working for? Who are you making rich? The more I sold, the more money I made, and of course, the more deductions came out of my paycheck. It was inspiring. I wanted out of the employee trap to get out so badly that I worked even harder so I could invest more. By 1978, I was consistently one of the top five sales people at the company. I badly wanted out of the rat race. In less than three years, I was making more in my real estate holding corporation than I was making at Xerox. Now he introduces Financial IQ. Financial IQ is made up of knowledge from four broad areas of expertise. Number one, you got to know accounting because it's financial literacy or the ability to read numbers. Number two, no surprise, investing. It's the science of money making money. Number three, understanding markets. Understanding markets is the science of supply and demand. And number four, the law. A person who understands the tax advantages and protections provided by a corporation can get rich so much faster than someone who is an employee or a small business sole proprietor. Now we go to chapter five, lesson five, the rich invent money. money. 
Once we leave school, most of us know that it's not so much a matter of college degrees or good grades that count. In the real world, outside of academics, something more than just grades is required. I have heard it called many things. Guts, chutzpah, balls, audacity, bravado, cunning, daring, tenacity, and brilliance. This factor, whatever it is labeled, ultimately decides one's future much more than school grades do. Inside each of us is one of these brave, brilliant, and daring characters. Reminds me of the John D. Rockefeller quote, no other quality is as essential to success as perseverance. And that's really what it comes down to. You gotta keep on trying and gotta keep on pushing. As long as you're on the right path, and that's the big one that you gotta figure out beforehand. <clears throat> land was wealth 300 years ago, so the person who owned the land owned the wealth. Later, wealth was in factories and production, and America rose to dominance. The industrials, the industrialists owned the wealth. Today, wealth is in information. Now, this is interesting for anyone seeking to teach, because what Robert says here is that he used gamification in order to do what he did in his other business. In 1984, I began teaching via games and simulations, and I still rely on these tools today. I always encourage adult students to look at games as reflecting back to them what they know and what they need to learn. Most importantly, games reflect behavior. They are instant feedback systems. Instead of the teacher lecturing you, the game is giving you a personalized lecture, one that is custom made just for you. So now Robert recalls that Rich Dad used to say money is made up. What does that mean? Let's find out. The rich make money. The more real you think money is, the harder you will work for it. If you can grasp the idea that money is not real, you will grow rich faster. Um, Mike and I often came back with, what is money that's not real? <laughs> what we agree it is, was all Rich Dad would say to that. The example to show this, Robert says, is him finding a secret ways that no one knows to buy real estate, buy low, sell high, as he says here. Houses that were once $100,000 were now $75,000, but instead of shopping with local real estate agents, I began shopping at the bankruptcy attorney's office or the courthouse steps. In those shopping places, a $75,000 house could sometimes be bought for $20,000 or less. Wrong, again, sorry, but in most countries and in this day and age, not 1997, but today, that's not possible. Banks typically put the property for sale just like any other, so it sells at market prices. Now, Robert explains his financial strategy for us all here, but I just need you to know that this is very, very rare, and it's exactly why Robert doesn't really talk about it um, anymore, uh, or why really anybody doesn't talk about it because he can't really do it. So personally, I use two main vehicles to achieve financial growth, real estate and small cap stocks. I use real estate as my foundation. Day in and day out, my properties provide cash flow and occasionally spurts of growth and value. Small cap stocks are used for fast growth. It's not gambling if you know what you're doing. It is gambling if you're just throwing money into a deal and praying. The idea in anything is to use your technical knowledge, wisdom, and love of the game to cut the odds down to lower the risk. Wrong again. Like, I mean, it may be a, t a, a, a fact that he wrote it in 1997 um, because, uh, you know, literally, um, uh, literally, it takes 50 steps to buy a property um, and then rent it out. And there are dozens of stock strategies out there. And Robert does not talk about any of them here. So again, this is all like an overview that he's giving, as you can see, but he's not giving you the details and the devil is in the details. I'm not saying Robert is the devil. In school, we learn that mistakes are bad and we are punished for making them. Yet if you look at the way humans are designed to learn, we learn by making mistakes. We learn to walk by falling down. If we never fell down, we would never walk. That's a really nice quote, and I like it. Now Robert says there are two types of investors. The first and most common type 
is a person who buys a packaged investment. They call a retail outlet such as a real estate company, a stockbroker or a financial planner and they buy something. The second type of investor creates investments. This investor usually assembles a deal in the same way a person who buys components builds a computer. To be the second type, you need to find an opportunity that everyone else missed. And that's the hard part. And that's where the entrepreneurship comes in that we've been banging on about, but Robert doesn't really kind of help in that regard. So like Robert did with buying bankrupt real estate, that is the opportunity everyone missed except him, hence why he made money. The other option is to raise money. The average person only goes to the bank. The second type of investor needs to know how to raise capital, and there are many ways that don't require a bank. To get started, I learned, Robert speaking, how to buy houses without a bank. It was the learned skill of raising money, more than the houses themselves, and that was priceless. Okay, Robert, so not everyone is going to raise money um, to buy a house, and from who exactly? I mean, this day, I mean, and for the last century, to buy a property, uh, you go to a bank to get the loan. Um, and, you know, since banking began, that's really been the biggest thing that they've serviced besides helping and paying governments and so forth. The property market's really been the bread and butter of the banking industry. Look, it's fine, maybe in the future, and I'm sure there are actually now startups that are trying to fix this problem, allowing other people to help you finance your home loan, and it is in existence, but you usually don't get as good rates, low enough rates, the rates are higher, and you have a lot of fees and a lot of restrictions. So still, to this day, getting a loan from a bank is still, for an investor, the best type of fundraising. And the last of the, th and the third, organize smart people. Intelligent people are those who work with or hire a person who is more intelligent than they are. Okay, we remember this rich dad talking about a hire the smartest people. Well, you obviously gotta have the money to hire the smartest people, but we're getting there now. Chapter six, lesson six, work to learn, don't work for money. Job security meant everything to my educated dad. Learning meant everything to my rich dad. Robert explains that selling is as important as the quality of the thing you're selling. Um, in his not so friendly encounter with a journalist. So let's find out. I'm a terrible writer, Robert said. You are a great writer. I went to sales school. You have a master's degree. Put them together and you get a best selling author and a best writing author. Anger flared from their eyes. I'll never stoop so low as to learn how to sell. Robert is also shocked at how little talented people earn. Um, and look, this lesson of his about selling, it is very important because you can have everything amazing, um, you know, made, but if no one knows about it, like, I mean, you're not giving it out to people. They don't know about it. You're not helping them in any way. And so he goes on to say, they are one skill away from great wealth. And he's really talking about the skill of sales when he's saying this. What this phrase means is that most people need only to learn and master one more skill and their income would jump exponentially. Again, it's about sales. Um, because if you, again, you need to tell people about what it is that you're making for them, because I mean, otherwise they don't know that it exists. I have mentioned before that financial intelligence is a synergy of accounting, investing, marketing, and law. Combine those four technical skills and making money with money is easier than most people would believe. When it comes to money, the only skill most people know is to work hard. If you want to be rich and happy, don't go to school. Now that is the title that I just said of an earlier book that Robert wrote and it highlights his exact lesson about sales and how important that skill is. That title was chosen because we knew it would get tons of publicity. I am pro-education and believe in education reform. If I were not pro-education, why would I continue to press for changing our antiquated educational system? So I chose a title that would get me on more TV and radio shows, simply because I was willing to be controversial. <coughs> Robert reveals his first business, the one that later he would explain failed, 
right here, right now. In 1997, I formed my first company. Rich Dad had groomed Mike and me to take over companies, so I now had to learn to form them and put them together. My first product, the nylon and Velcro wallet, and that's the one that failed. And he talks about it more in other books and in many of the interviews. <clears throat> so he summarizes this chapter, which remember was titled, Don't Work For Money, chapter six, Don't Work For Money by saying, I recommend to young people to seek work for what they will learn more than what they will earn. Old cliche that goes, job is an acronym for just over broke. So you got to learn first, obviously, in order to then to be able to act, take, take action on what it is that you've learned. Further, he says something that everyone knows but doesn't like to admit. Workers work hard enough to not be fired and owners pay just enough so that workers won't quit. This is so true. And look, I'm not, I'm not, I know I bagged Robert out a little bit, you know, before, but I mean, when he does say something, he is due credit for it. And this is a really clear one. The incentives are always seemingly like that unless you pay more, give people something more, etc. So then if you do work to learn, what should you learn? Robert explains. The main management skills needed for success. One, management of cash flow. Two, management of systems. Three, management of people. He finishes it off with what we expected if we have listened so far. The most important specialized skills are sales and marketing. The ability to sell, to communicate to another human being, be it a customer, employee, boss, spouse, or child, is the base skill of personal success. Communication skills such as writing, speaking, and negotiating are crucial to a life of success. These are skills I work on constantly, attending courses or buying educational resources to expand my knowledge. Pushing onwards now. Chapter seven, overcoming obstacles. There are five main reasons why financially literate people may still not develop abundant asset columns that could produce a large cash flow. Number one, fear. Number two, cynicism. Number three, laziness. Number four, bad habits. And number five, arrogance. We'll go through each and every single one of them like Rob does in the book. Overcoming fear. It's how you handle fear. It's how you handle losing. It's how you handle failure that makes the difference in one's life. The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage that fear. The greatest reason for a lack of financial success was because most people played it too safe. People are so afraid of losing that they lose were his words. For most people, the reason they don't win financially is because the main pain of losing is far greater than the joy of being rich. Failure inspires winners. The greatest secret of winners is that failure inspires winning. Thus, they're not afraid of losing. That's important if you have a growth mindset. A lot of people don't. They have a fixed mindset. This is just my two cents. So if you look at losing as learning, then you're going to be winning because you're going to keep on trying and trying and trying. Important point. Everyone you consider successful obviously has made a lot of mistakes. If you read any biographies, and maybe I'm going to do some book reviews and some great biographies to highlight this point, is that none of them can win or succeed without first losing a lot and having a lot of failures. And that's what you see time and time again in people's biographies who have got anywhere in life. Do not do what poor and middle class people do. Put their few eggs in many baskets. Put a lot of your eggs in a few baskets and focus. Follow one course until successful. I'd have to say wrong on this one, like I've said wrong on a few other things. <laughs> Statistically speaking, this is incorrect. If you focus on one basket, now I know he says a few baskets. He doesn't say like just one, I get it. Um, but the implication is like, you know, focus on one or two or three. Um, if you put, you know, your money in one company, there's a large chance that you'll lose everything. If you put it and spread it out over a large number of companies, then there's less of a chance that you're going to go downhill. It's why a lot of people invest in index funds because index funds are averages and they put little investments because they have billions and trillions now of dollars into different companies. So they follow like the general trend of the stock market going up. Again, Robert said a few, he didn't say one. So I'll not be too slack against him here. 
Um, now, overcoming cynicism. Remember, cynicism is the number two point. Uh, Peter Lynch of Fidelity Magellan Mutual Fund fame refers to warnings about the sky falling as noise, and we all hear it in the media. This is bad. That's going to happen. Oh my God, statistics have come out. Recession. A lot of it's noise if you have focus in on what it is you're doing. Noise is either created inside our heads or comes from the outside, often from friends, family, co-workers, and the media. <clears throat> Lynch recalls the time during the 1950s when the threat of nuclear war was so prevalent in the news that people began building fallout shelters and storing food and water. If they had invested that money wisely in the market instead of building a fallout shelter, they'd probably be financially independent today. I hate to break it <laughs> to Robert, but if he has any history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that was in 1960, we were literally about a few seconds from nuclear war, okay? So um, it was that close to having a nuke fired from Cuban mainland over into America. So those fallout shelters, you know, were on par, on, on the balance of probabilities, a good investment. Next one is overcoming laziness. Today, I often meet people who are too busy to take care of their wealth, and there are people too busy to take care of their health. The cause is the same. They're busy, and they stay busy as a way of avoiding something they do not want to face. Next one is overcoming bad habits. What I know makes me money. What I don't know loses me money. Every time I have been arrogant, I have lost money because when I'm arrogant, I truly believe that what I don't know is not important. Rich Dad would often tell me that sentence. So look, I mean, this is what Rich Dad said. Again, there's so many things that you can learn. You usually have to, and Robert Warren Buffett does a really good job of saying circles of competence, right? And there's usually about three or four circles of competence and you really focus in on those areas because they're interrelated to what you're doing. If you're an investor, you have to know about general world events, about how to read financial statements, about you know, learning about specifics of a company, the directors, the events, the history, the strategy. That's you know relevant. If you want to learn everything in the world, that's great. There's only so much time that we've got. Hence why I made this YouTube channel. So maybe I could help you learn a lot about a lot of things. Chapter eight, getting started. These are Robert's tips for life that we're gonna go through. Number one, find a reason greater than reality, the power of spirit. When people ask me what my reason for wanting to be rich is, I tell them that it is a combination of deep emotional wants and don't wants. I will list a few. First, the don't wants, for they create the wants. I don't want to work all my life. I don't want what my parents aspired for, which was job security and a house in the suburbs. Now for the wants. I want to be free to travel the world and live in the lifestyle I love. I want to be young when I do this. Don't know if you can achieve that now, but I want to simply be free. I want control over my time and my life. I want money to work for me. Most people know what they don't want, um, but don't know what they do want. Start with don't want first. So this is actually a very good way to do it because the don't want's usually quite clear, whereas the do want's are very hard, but you find out the do want's, like Robert says, from first knowing the don't want's. Number two, make daily choices, the power of choice. Financially, with every dollar we get in our hands, we hold the power to choose our future, to be rich, poor, or middle class. Our spending habits reflect who we are. In other words, you are what you spend. Number three, choose friends carefully, the power of association. Remember, you are the average of the five people or more that you associate with. I do not choose my friends by their financial statements. I have friends who have actually taken a vow of poverty, as well as friends who earn millions every year. The point is that I learn from all of them. Now I will admit that there are people I've actually sought out because they had money, but I was not after their money. I was seeking their knowledge. My, uh, uh, and number four, master a formula and then learn a new one. The power of learning quickly, you become what you study. In other words, be careful what you learn because your mind is so powerful that you become what you put in your head. 
Years ago when I was 26, I took a weekend class called how to buy real estate foreclosures. I learned a formula and that next trick was to have the discipline to actually put it into action what I had learned. And this is where you know he figured out how to you know supposedly buy properties that were uh, being put bankrupt onto the market. Now, obviously such opportunities don't exist and Robert was lucky, right? Because now you don't have that ability. But you should be out and you should be looking for those opportunities. They do exist. Number five, pay yourself first. The power of self-discipline. Simply put, people who have low self-esteem and low tolerance for financial pressure can never be rich. As I have said, a lesson learned from my rich dad was that the world will push you around. The world pushes people around, not because other people are bullies, but because the individual lacks internal control and discipline. You've got to know the value of yourself and your time. This is a big one. You've got to be able to, and especially when you figure out what you want to do, time becomes more focused. You know what you want and what you don't want, and you eliminate the distractions that get in your way of the goal that you've set for yourself. This diagram is how Robert worked and put all that wage income into the bankrupted properties he'd buy, as you can see here. So to successfully pay yourself first, keep the following in mind. Don't get into large debt positions that you have to pay for. Keep your expenses low. Build up assets first. Then buy the big house or nice car. Being stuck in the rat race is not intelligent. Number two, when you come up short, let the pressure build and don't dip into your savings or investments. Use the pressure to inspire your financial genius to come up with new ways of making more money and then pay for your bills. You will have increased your ability to make more money as well as your financial intelligence. So can you see that Robert wants you to feel pressure like he did when he was nine years old and Rich Dad was telling him, hey, I'm not gonna pay you anything because I want you to learn the lesson. And that lesson was, surprise, surprise, Become an entrepreneur because only then can you make money work for you, not have you work for money. And that is the basis, that comic book business for him, of the financials, uh, wealth and income that he then later used. And of course, like, you know, using Rich Dad as an example, his businesses that he put Robert and Mike into work inside, like grocery stores, they were the basis for the money that he made, which he then put into investments like real estate which had money make money for him but of course again entrepreneurship is not mentioned that's okay but i'm just gonna keep annoying slightly i'll stop soon because we're nearing the end and number six is pay your brokers well the power of good advice now rich dad believing in paying professionals well as we've talked about and I have adopted that policy also, says Robert. Today I've had expensive attorneys, accountants, real estate brokers, and stockbrokers. Why? Because if, and I do mean if, the people are professionals, their services should make you money. And the more money they make, the more money I make. Seven, be an Indian giver. The power of getting something for nothing. So when the European settlers came to America, he says the story, they were taken aback by cultural practice. Uh, so some Americans, some American Indians had. For example, if a settler was cold, the Indian would give the person a blanket, mistaking it for a gift. The settler was often offended when the Indian asked later for that blanket back. Um, and the Indians got upset when they realized the settlers did not want to give it back because they're like, didn't she give this as a gift to me? <laughs> the lesson is invest and reap the return of passive income or work and reap the return of knowledge. So use assets, number eight, use assets to buy luxuries, the power of focus. The difference is I don't buy them on credit. It's the keep up with the Joneses trap. When I wanted to buy a Porsche, the easy road would have been to call my banker and get a loan. So the benefits of buying using a loan is only if you do it as a company expense and then you claim the loan and interest as a deduction against the income your business, your company makes. That way you're not owning the car, you're paying to use it only, and you're offsetting the income that you're making, which inevitably will turn into profits, and you're lowering those profits because you, know, you don't want to be taxed that much on them. So that's the idea, but again, like I said earlier, 
uh, the car has to be used for business expenses. So that's a very clear thing you have to not make mistakes with. And choose heroes. Number nine, choose heroes, the power of myth. But heroes do more than simply inspire us. Heroes make things look easy. Making it look easy convinces us to want to be just like them. So says Roberts. If they can do it, so can I. When it comes to investing, too many people make it sound hard. Instead, find heroes who make it look easy. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Again, a lot of dangers here. If you make something sound too easy, yes, you'll get a lot of people coming to you, but then they're gonna be more disillusioned at the end when they realize how hard it really is, okay? So you can't make stuff up, and it sounds like Robert's sort of trying to go there without saying it, but you know, you really wanna be honest as much as you can be because you know, a lot of things aren't for people because it really is much harder than it's sold. And that's really, you know, the industry that some people know about with these authors, like they say one thing, it sounds too good to be true, it usually is because it sounds too good to be true and that's the reason why. Number 10, teach and you shall receive the power of giving. Whenever you feel short or in need of something, give what you want first and it will come back in buckets. That is true for money, a smile, love or friendship. Remind me of having courage to shake someone's hand first or say hello, begin a conversation. That's the example of giving first, uh, you know, of you know, being the first person to shape the events. Uh, and then letting the events happen after you've initiated first. So look, it's a big thing. I do agree with this, uh, you know, giving or reaching out first. It's a skill that a lot of us like don't naturally get told about, but it definitely helps because then you can get a lot more in the world and you can bring a lot more people together because you can easily, without fear, talk to others. Chapter nine, still want more? Here are some to-dos. Stop doing what you're doing. In other words, take a break and assess what is working and what is not working. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Look for new ideas, for new investing ideas. I go to bookstores and I search for books on different and unique subjects. I call them formulas. I buy how-to books on formulas I know nothing about. Now, look, this is a good point about serendipity, which is a hard thing for a lot of us to get. Because we look at our phones, we look at you know the screens that we're on, and they give us a bubble of information that is similar to previous searches that we've done. So we can't ever learn anything new outside of that bubble of topics that the algorithm has already created. It's important to go out, which is why if you pop into a library, you're you know are given that random stuff, right? You're going to deviate to certain topic areas that you like, but the chance of you learning something new is highly increased compared to what you would otherwise have got through your device. Uh, checking out a newspaper, as much as you think, oh, why would I do that? Well, the newspaper is actually randomized in terms of its subject matter. Like it doesn't create those topics just for you. When you pick up the newspaper, it doesn't have your name written on it, which is how news is on devices on the internet it is tailored for you like it's actually got your name attached to that feed so newspapers that are physical are definitely going to give you stuff that you would have never have come across so keep that in mind it's an important point for actually learning about new ideas very very important i do it regularly it's hard physically you've got to do it or get the thing delivered to you but it's an amazing hack Find someone who has done what you want to do, take them to lunch and ask them for tips and tricks of the trade. This sounds obvious and you know why you should do this. Take classes, read and attend seminars. I search newspapers, just like we just talked about. Um, make a lot of offers. Now he's talking about real estate here. Um, I look at many properties and generally I write an offer. I don't know what the right offer is, neither do I. Um, well, anyway, he's just talking about like his strategy for property. And then he keeps going about that. Shop for bargains in all markets. Consumers will always be poor, 
When the supermarket has a sale, say on toilet paper, the consumer runs in and stocks up. Um, so, I mean, I guess he's obviously talking about, you know, still being, uh, still being, you know, smart with your money and not wasting it. So when there is a bargain, go and get it. Look in the right places. A neighbor bought a condominium for $100,000. I bought the identical condo next door for $50,000. He told me he's waiting for the price to go up. I told him that profit is made when you buy, not when you sell. He shopped with a real estate broker who owns no property of her own. I shopped at the foreclosure auction. I paid $500 for a class on how to do this. So of course he's talking about, look, you can't overpay for stuff and expect then to make money if you've overpaid. And also to hire the right people, which he's talked about before. Here, his friend had a real estate broker who never owned, owned but any property, so she really didn't know as much as a broker that would uh, have known if they had owned property. And of course, Robert can do no wrong. <laughs> Look for people who want to buy first. Keeps going about this. And if you want to make profit first, find out if there is a buyer for what you think you want to sell. Say it's a new foreign clothing brand. If you list it on eBay, are there any clicks or bids even before you own it? Because that is what's called drop shipping. If person buys it on your eBay listing, you can at that exact moment buy it on say Amazon, put the bidder's address, the successful bidder's address so that Amazon then ships that product over to the buyer and you get the profit differential. That's the way drop shipping really works. This is now Robert's final thoughts, the three incomes. In the world of accounting, there are three different types of income. One, ordinary earned. Two, portfolio. Three, passive income. In most cases, is income derived from real estate investments. That's what he considers passive. Portfolio income is income derived from paper assets, as such as stocks and bonds. Portfolio is the income that makes Bill Gates the richest man in the world, not earned income. Uh, and of course, passive income is what Robert considers the best for him. Remember, he does shares and he does real estate. So he has portfolio as well as passive. Can you believe it? We finished the book. Congratulations and thank you if you've stayed right till the end because you would have learned something that the summary would not have shown you. And now it's time for our comment competition, which is important because if you had gone through the entire video, you would know that I'm gonna ask a question that is pretty much really relevant to things that you would have learned through every step of the way on this video. So the best answer to our question in the comments below, yes, just below this video on YouTube, will win $100 US sent to your PayPal email address and the winner will be announced at the start of the next video. The question, research what kind of entrepreneurial businesses Rich Dad was involved in that gave him the money to buy investment assets. So do that if you can. There's a lot of information on the internet. And remember then to put that into as best as you can and answer the questions below. Remember to also like, subscribe, tap the notification and share and subscribe to the Substack newsletter uh, because we're gonna be able to show you bonus behind the scenes information and content to this video and future private videos that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Thank you so much for staying with me. I hope you learned something. This is the start of many new videos like this and it's going to be an amazing ride because I hope to give you something back more than you ever would have imagined because books are hard, but we're going to make them easy. Thank you so much and see you soon.